Um, so we still got people coming in. Uh, Jacob will be admitting those. I'll go ahead and start because you didn't come here to listen to me anyway. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our our uh, visiting speaker for the Monroe Payne uh, lecture here today, Mike Munger. He received his PhD from a, a little trade school over there by Forest Park in St. Louis, uh, Washington University. I think that's what they call it. Um, He's had a uh, distinguished career. I've known uh, Mike for 35 years or so. I first met him as a graduate student at the University of Texas, which was his first uh, tenure track position. After leaving Texas, he went to North Carolina Chapel Hill. And then in 1997, he went to Duke University where he's been since that period of time. Uh, Mike is a distinguished scholar. He's got a number of uh, edited books and, and uh, authored books, including Ideology and the Theory of Political Choice and Analytical Politics, uh, which has a revision, Choosing in Groups, uh, which has a joint author. Conveniently, he found this young guy named Munger as well, uh, who co-authored with that book. He's also uh, got books on analyzing politics, Tomorrow 3.0. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about Is Capitalism Sustainable, a more recent book. He's also co-authored, uh, or co-edited, I should say, a book on philosophy, politics, and economics. He is the director of the PE, PE program there at Duke. He's probably got over 150 research articles, hundreds of newspaper articles and book reviews and so forth. Uh, he really has been a pleasure to know. He's a great colleague to work with. Um, a gentleman and a scholar. He's been a libertarian candidate uh, for governor and recently for the state legislature. I did not win. Let, let's get that straight. I did not win. <laughs> don't, don't, don't leave him hanging. <laughs> well, I want to imply uh, as, as the best I can for you because I don't think you got a very high percentage of the vote there, but you did very well considering. Move on. <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, I turn over the, the floor over to uh, an excellent colleague, uh, Mike Bunker. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let me share my screen. And so I'm going to talk a bit about my most recent book, which was Is Capitalism Sustainable?, but a little bit about my forthcoming book on the platform economy, because the connection between those is that I think the platform economy is a direction capitalism is going to take. So let me start in what may seem like an odd place. Uh, Cicero, in his book of duty, raises an interesting question. Um, so Quintus Scavola, the son of Publius, when asked to have the price of an estate that he was buying named once for all, and the seller had complied with his request, said that he thought it worth more and added 100,000 sesterces. Now, those of you that have tried to buy something in real estate probably have not found it work this way. If you're trying to sell your house, it's unlikely that you say, well, I'd like 150,000 for it. And they say, oh, no, no, it's worth at least 220. I insist. Uh, instead, they whatever price you have, they actually don't care. Whatever price you quote, they're going to try to get it for less. So what Cicero says is there's no one who would say that this was the, not the act of a good man. Men in general would not regard it as the act of a wise man any more than if he had sold an estate for less than it would bring. This then is the mischievous doctrine regarding some men as good and others as wise. So I come from part of political science and economics called public choice. And the claim of public choice is not that people are inherently bad, it's that people are inherently people and we cannot assume that good people is the answer to a problem of bad policy. That we should worry more about rules than we should about um, having, having good people. In fact, what we need is rules that will work well even if people are bad. And uh, a number of my colleagues at Duke until fairly recently, about uh, a little over four years ago, always took that as being hypothetical, but they're much more susceptible to that claim now that perhaps some of the structures of government, uh, like federalism or separation of powers, actually may hold some role because a bad person or a wise person who tries to maximize on every margin uh, 
we can't assume that a good person is going to hold office. So I think what's interesting and the reason that, that Cicero, the Cicero quote is important, Cicero is saying this is a mischievous doctrine that why would you say that someone can be wise or good, but not both? So wise means you're trying to get as much money as possible. Good means you're trying to be honest. Why can't you be both? Well, I wanna start with a theorem and the theorem is simple. So I put it in quotes. The if part would say, if exchanges are you voluntary and profits are the excess of revenue over costs in a market without artificial constraints. Now, you voluntary is a word that I made up. It means truly voluntary. And if you're interested, you can Google you voluntary and find out there's six conditions that I claim make something truly voluntary. Because a lot of people will say, voluntary exchange is not enough. We have to have truly voluntary. So fair enough. If we can agree that exchanges are truly voluntary, now, what that means is that if I'm a business person, I go to labor and I make truly voluntary exchanges, which means that I offer to pay them a wage that is more than the wage they, the minimum wage they'd be willing to work for. And if I need to buy some steel and some plastic and some energy things to make the product that I want to make, I pay all of the input suppliers an amount that's actually more than the, the minimum they would be willing to accept. So every exchange is voluntary, it makes both parties better off. And then I go to output markets and I sell consumer products to consumers and I sell it at a price that makes them happy to purchase it. So notice the way this story works. Every one of the input suppliers is happy to see me. Everyone, every consumer who buys my product, they are happy to see that product. Suppose that after all those exchanges clear, there is some money left over. That is, I get money from consumers. I pay off all of the voluntary contracts with my input suppliers. I have some money left over. We have a specific technical name for the money that's left over. It's called profit. So if profits are the excess of revenue over costs in a market without artificial constraints, then Entrepreneurship is virtuous. A good man and the wise man are the same. It is the habit of the alert seeking of exchange opportunities embedded in a character of forbearance of rent seeking opportunities. Now, why would this be important? The reason I want to claim it's important is that it could be that profits don't result from voluntary contracts, that profits don't result from me selling in an ex in output market where consumers want to buy my product. It could be that I have not invested just in capital and equipment, but I've also invested in the political process. And I have secured for my company legal but unfair rents that come about as the result of government policy. It could be subsidies, it could be protection from competition. But I'm saying if none of that's true, if I'm actually, so this is a sort of idealized setting, if all the contracts are voluntary and I don't get any artificial protection or constraint, then entrepreneurship is virtuous in the sense that you're creating value. But there's a problem of sustainability, which is why I want to ask if capitalism is sustainable because what I talked about on the previous slide is what market defenders would describe as capitalism. Well, does that exist in the world? And if it did exist in the world, would it be sustainable? And I want to argue that no, for two obvious and immediate reasons. One is, suppose that an owner manager works for a company. Now, your contract says you have a fiduciary duty. I have the duty to earn profits for my stockholders. Can the manager of good character behave virtuously if rent-seeking opportunities are available? Remember, rent-seeking is the pursuit of government protection or a government aid that has nothing to do with the value of my product. It's just because I have enough political power to get excess, excess profits. And so we see examples of this fairly often on Wall Street, maybe some energy companies like Solyndra, sugar producers. There's, there's a lot of instances where we see political pursuits by large corporations. Well, suppose that the manager believes I understand that it is legal for me to hire lobbyists, but the manager says, although it's legal, it is immoral, and I refuse to do it. Can that manager survive? Well, the result would be 
relatively depressed share prices. Now, I could explain to my stockholders, let's say, that the reason that our stock is not doing as well as it might is that I, the manager, think it is immoral to pursue rents and government subsidies. They might very well say, well, you get to think that about your own stock, but this is our stock. And there's a competitive market for managers out there. And so they're going to hire a manager who does not suffer from these delusions and who will pursue legal but immoral means of increasing stock prices. But let's suppose that's not true. Let's suppose instead that stockholders actually agree with the manager. Well, if I'm a corporate takeover artist, I notice that your capital is undervalued by 12 or 15%. And I look at it a little bit and I say, well, the reason is there's a bunch of lobbying opportunities that they're not taking advantage of. So I go to a bank and I lay out the portfolio of your firm and I say, look, their stock is undervalued by at least 15%. If you loan me enough money to make a tender offer for a controlling interest in this company, I'll pay you back by tomorrow at 5 p.m. So I use the money to finance a tender offer for a controlling interest. I buy, and the stockholders are willing to sell because they get a 15% premium. I buy the stock. The increase in the value of the stock is enough for me to pay off the loan. And I fire the managers. And now we start pursuing rent-seeking activities, subsidies, and lobbying. So Notice that it's, this is not a criticism based on public policy. This is the internal logic of capitalism itself. The, the competitive market for managers or the mergers and acquisitions market mean that capitalism has an inherent tendency towards cronyism. And cronyism is a system that is based on rent seeking. And in fact, one of the standard claims about public choice is that we're going to assume that everyone is rational, everyone is maximizing. It would be irrational not to increase profits if it is, if it is legal to do so, even if it's immoral. So you may remember in Star Wars, so the, the thing on the left, the green thing, that's actually the plans to the Death Star that were stolen in the movie Rogue One, which was obviously out of order, uh, but it wasn't very sophisticated plans, but what it showed was that there were these thermal exhaust ports and the residents of the Death Star were rather famously indifferent to the possible threat, even though, as you remember, there was this, I mean, you could imagine when you, when you learned about this, okay, so wait, let me get this straight. We're supposed to be a fortified, impregnable Death Star. And there's this hole that goes straight from the surface all the way to the central reactor. Who designed this stupid thing? But you can understand why the rebels were very happy to get this design. But the point is, at one point, Grand Moff Tarkin gets bad news. And the commander comes in and says, we've analyzed their attack, sir, and there is a danger. Should I have your ship standing by? And Grand Moff Tarkin says, evacuate in our moment of triumph. I think you overestimate their chances. He's scornful of this. <clears throat> well, does that make sense? So. I have learned something about myself that I'm not very proud of. I have more than a few colleagues here at Duke University that are big fans of socialism. And when they talk about how great socialism is, I will often say, look, look at Venezuela. Look what happens when you try socialism. And their answer is, oh, no, that's not socialism. Socialism is better than that. That, was, that just went wrong. And I smugly say, oh, fine, yes, but if that's what socialism becomes, you can't pretend that socialism is viable because it has a tendency to become like Venezuela. Well, I was struck about five years ago with the fact that pro-market people do exactly the same thing that they decry in others. So this was from a discussion on Medium and someone had heard a talk and said it was very, heard it, read an article and said it was very interesting, but said, in my opinion, the most important problem of capitalism that you didn't mention is lobbying. And the immediate response was, oh no, that's not capitalism, that's cronyism or corporatism, it's the opposite. So defenders of markets will point to pathologies or perversions of capitalism and say, yeah, but that's not capitalism. If we had real capitalism, we wouldn't need to worry about that. 
what if capitalism actually has an inherent tendency towards cronyism, particularly in a democracy? If capitalism in a democracy always becomes cronyism, people who say, well, we should defend markets have a much more difficult task, just like I would say my leftist colleagues have a difficult task defending socialism when there are examples like Venezuela. So on Vice News, Betsy DeVos is going to let one company handle all one trillion federal student loans. And Nora Meisen says, come on, that's not capitalism. You can't criticize that as if it were capitalism. And Norm Ornstein says, that's crony capitalism. Well, OK, you can call it by a different name if you want. But if that's the direction that capitalism takes, there's a problem. So the defense is always, that's not capitalism, that's cronyism. But what if cronyism is actually an essential feature in any democratic system that tries to be capitalist? And let me spin out a story. This is pretty standard public choice. Voters are passive and rationally uninformed. Individual politicians benefit from cronyism. Individual corporate CEOs benefit from cronyism. Now, it makes the system worse off, but it's a kind of prisoner's dilemma. And if you're participating in the cronyism, you can benefit from it. It's very difficult to prevent, but it's easy to foment. Now, if those three things are true, and actually that's just straight from the public choice catechism, those three things are just standard public choice about rationality, the only hope would be for one of those groups to act morally, recognizing that cronyism is harmful to the system. But then that's virtue. You're doing the one thing that public choice says we cannot do. We cannot assume that good people make a bad system work. If the system has this tendency towards pathology, and if rational people will participate in it, then we have to concede just like Grand Moff Tarkin would not concede that there is a danger and perhaps our ship should be ready to evacuate. So Adam Smith famously, you often see this quoted, um, just the first part of this passage in book one, chapter 10 of the Wealth of Nations, you see this quoted, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. It is impossible indeed to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or would be consistent with liberty and justice. So that would just seem to say capitalism is not self-regulating, we need regulation. But you need to look at the rest of that passage. But though the law cannot hinder people of the same trade from sometimes assembling together, it ought to do nothing to facilitate such assemblies, much less to render them necessary. A regulation which obliges all those of the same trade in a particular town to enter their names and places of abode in a public register facilitates such assemblies. Now, we would now recognize that that's because it reduces the transactions cost of organization. So what Smith is saying is you need to recognize that Mansur Olson taught us that reducing the transaction cost of collective action is going to benefit group lobbying. So a, a regulation which enables those of the same trade to tax themselves by giving them a common interest renders such assemblies necessary. So what Adam Smith is doing is saying, if you, and he, he actually was very optimistic about public policy, he thought that Government officials who read his book would say, ah, all right, then that means we should not make it necessary for these groups to come together because it'll be better for the public. But Adam Smith had not read Gordon Tulloch because what Gordon Tulloch would say is, why would you expect elected officials to care about the public? What's true is that elected officials care about elected officials. And Adam Smith here actually gives a detailed argument for why it benefits both the state and corporate CEOs to participate in cronyism. So the problem is you can't defend capitalism by assuming a benevolent dictator. You can't justify socialism, I always say, by assuming a benevolent dictator, but then you also can't defend capitalism by assuming a benevolent dictator. Sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. A democratic state will always want to make such assemblies necessary. So they see Adam Smith's argument and they don't say, oh, that's right, that's a problem. What he sees as a bug, they see as a feature. That's an advantage of requiring these gatherings. So in 2000, I'm not very good at Photoshopping, 
But so in, in 2008, Grand Moff Greenspan famously got some bad news. Um, commander comes in, we've analyzed their attacks, sir, and assuming altruistic CEOs is silly while invoking a benevolent government violates basic public choice theory. Should we just admit that capitalism is unsustainable? And Grand Moff Greenspan basically did. This is famous, this is an actual quote. What, what Greenspan, this is known as Greenspan's mea culpa. Those of us who've looked to the self-interest of lending institution to protect shareholders' equity are in a state of shocked disbelief. So what Greenspan thought was that the prospect of bankruptcy would be sufficient to discipline the risk-taking behavior of large Wall Street firms. But large Wall Street firms recognize the truth of the old maxim. If I owe you $1,000 and I go bankrupt, I'm sad. If I owe you a million dollars and I go bankrupt, you're sad. If it's a hundred million, then there's a pretty good chance that the government is going to bail you out. Now that's good work if you can get it. You take a lot of really risky investments and if they turn out well, you keep the money. If they turn out really, really badly, you get bailed out by the state. So what Greenspan was assuming was that capitalism is self-regulating. However, in a democracy, the pressures to bail out large corporations on Wall Street may be irresistible. And in fact, if you look at the Dodd-Frank legislation, they go and try to define very carefully a CFI, a systemically important financial institution. And it has a list of things, a list of um, conditions, which I would imagine that the CEOs on Wall Street take as a to-do list. Well, so let's see, if we had this and this and this, that means we're a systemically important financial institution. And what Dodd-Frank says is we don't want any of those. Well, we don't really care what you want. If we're systemically important enough and we go bankrupt, we all know you have to bail us out. So let me distinguish capitalism, a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including private property rights where all good, all goods, intermediate and final goods are owned privately. An economy remains capitalist so long as the government refrains from intervening coercively in the peaceful private lives of citizens. Under pure capitalism, there's no taxes, no price ceilings, no price floors, no product controls, no subsidies to the rich or the poor, no public streets, no public schools, parks, central banks, or wars. Government neither resorts to aggression under capitalism, nor does it sanction its use by others. Well, by that definition, there's really never been a capitalist society. And that's fair enough because we think, well, sure, all systems are mixed. But if the state is in a position to provide public spending, if the state is in a position to do regulation, if the state is in a position to subsidize and to tax, that means that it has the power to create winners and losers. Why would we think that that power to create winners and losers will be used in the way that the public wants? Why do you think that a system based on power would protect the weak? Why do you think that a system based on majorities would protect minorities? In fact, it is likely to benefit the powerful. That means that if the state has that power, it will be misused and it will be misused because powerful economic interests will want it to, which means that Concentrated economic power will metastasize into concentrated political power. And it's difficult to see how anybody would think that capitalism then could survive. Now the alternative or an alternative is corporatism or cronyism. It's a social system where the government intervenes aggressively into the economy, typically with political instruments that benefit large corporations and other enterprises to the detriment of smaller businesses and private citizens. Subsidies, tariffs, import quotas, exclusive production privileges, antitrust, compulsory, compulsory cartelization designs. So we would expect not only that the capitalist economy and a democracy would be replete with these measures, but that they would expand quickly over time. And the reason is that from the perspective of the companies themselves, it is more profitable to invest in government help than it is in making better, cheaper products. So all too often, market advocates envision in kind of real world capitalism as retaining the features of their own ideal theory. 
So this is something that we who are pro-market often accuse the left of. Oh, you, you have this romantic imagination about socialism. Okay, I have a romantic imagination about markets. When opponents criticize some aspect of market, so Solyndra or Martin Shkreli's use of, of procedures to squelch competition, we say, no, that's not capitalism, that's crony capitalism. Well, might not a modern Hayek, but of the left, be tempted to write a treatise, The Road to Crony Capitalism. So F.A. Hayek famously wrote The Road to Serfdom. And in it, he describes the logic of the process by which the regulation of prices, which is what he means by socialism, not state ownership of the means of production, but the regulation of prices to achieve objectives of social justice, to the extent that regulating price causes distortion is going to cause a cascade of additional regulations to compensate for the fact that the distortions in the distortions caused by the initial wave of regulation is going to cascade and continue until you have to have more and more regulation, where at some point, much of the economy will be planned, or at least most prices will be regulated. And the story that I told at the beginning, my theorem, depends on unfettered prices to be able to give signals about the relative value of resources. So that's a problem. This Hayek, but of the left, who was writing The Road to Crony Capitalism, would say that capitalism is not sustainable, and any attempt to set up capitalism in democracies is actually a step towards crony capitalism. So how would that thesis work? Here's the thing that's upsetting. Basically, all he has to do is read public choice. There's no new knowledge here. All he has to do is read public choice. Let's suppose that businesses maximize accounting profits. Politicians seek to maximize power, including but not limited to re-election probabilities, and voters are poorly organized and poorly informed. Now, rationally, because of the collective action problem. So no one here is acting badly in the sense that they're evil. All they're doing is acting rationally. So those three assumptions are pretty standard public choice tenets. Taken together, they mean capitalism is unsustainable and always has at least a tendency to convert to cronyism. So let me distinguish two things, and many of you may know these two terms, but some of you may not. Profits, as I defined them in my theorem, are the excess of revenues from selling a product after costs are subtracted. Now, if the exchange is voluntary, each person buying the product must think she's better off. Entrepreneurs seek profits and therefore try to create value. Now, so one of the, one of the things I think we underestimate about capitalism is the value that is created by production of things people want to buy. Even the wealthiest entrepreneur is capturing only a small part of the value that's created. So you look at Apple's profits, Apple makes quite a few profits, but what are the benefits around the world of people having the option of buying an Apple phone? Many people would pay two dollars or $3,000 for an Apple phone. They only have to pay the admittedly pretty exorbitant $900 or $1,000 but each consumer is in effect making $1,000. Each of those purchases is an enormous benefit to the person buying it. So we're producing a ton of value if we're talking about profits that are produced from this kind of activity. But an alternative, and it may be hard to distinguish from an accounting perspective, is rent seeking. Rent seeking is a competition for an artificial prize or benefit created either by taking money away from taxpayers and then trying to give it away, so a subsidy, or a restriction on competition that allows an artificial increase in prices for products sold. So a tariff, a patent, intellectual property of various kinds. So political entrepreneurs are seeking rent and no value is created. All that's happening is that we're stunting innovation. So I have to have one equation because otherwise Jay Dow will complain. It's not in my contract, but Jay Dow is going to complain if I don't put at least one equation here. So honest profit is, we define profit with the Greek letter pi, is the price times output. And output is the production function where we combine capital and labor. And then we subtract the cost of capital, R times K, and we subtract the cost of labor, W times L. Now, suppose that I tell you that profits exceed zero. My theorem said that if profits exceed zero, it must be true that the benefits to the society are very large and that 
uh, entrepreneur is virtuous because all of the people, all of the input suppliers and all of the consumers are better off. This is a miraculous achievement. There's actual new value in the world, widely shared that was created by an entrepreneur. We might very well celebrate that as one of the most achie important achievements of modern society. And the reason is we often talk that there are two ways of obtaining wealth. One is exchange and the other is theft. Theft does not increase the total amount of wealth. If you look, the total amount of wealth in the world has increased by an enormous amount. Poverty has gone down by a lot. The reduction in poverty in China because of the use of markets, starting with Deng Xiaoping in 1973, has resulted in an enormous increase in wealth and in human happiness. So there is a story that you can tell that, boy, markets are doing a great job for us. However, <clears throat> rent seek and you will find profits because I've tried to mark in red those things that the government might be able to provide you some assistance with. And of course, it's everything. Well, what that means is that if I'm trying to maximize profits, I have a choice. I can do it the virtuous way and have voluntary contracts, or I can have the state use the fact that it has tanks and attack helicopters to coerce people into signing contracts that benefit me and harm them. I can get taxpayers money taken at gunpoint that is then transferred to me in the form of subsidies. And some voters may not like this. Most of them are not going to be aware of it because they're poorly organized. So the result is that there is a temptation to substitute rent seeking for profits. A rational economic actor is going to recognize that the marginal profitability of rent seeking exceeds returns to the pursuit of honest profit. Even if entrepreneurs forbear, a rational politician will recognize that power and electability can be improved by forcing a rent seeking society on entrepreneurs. So it's a marginality condition. It, if we invest in engineers and inventors, at some point it will become more profitable to invest in lobbyists and rent seeking specialists that have personal connections to legislators and regulators until the last dollar devoted to each produces an equal increment to accounting profits. So that's just the marginality condition. The only way capitalism can survive then is if the last dollar devoted to honest profits is still more productive than the first dollar devoted to rent seeking. And again, I didn't want to do this, but Jay insisted. So I had to put out to use a graph too. So the vertical axis is marginal profitability. The horizontal axis is investment spending. And the point is at the margin, more and more investment spending gives us lower marginal profitability. So we're investing in old fashioned capitalism. So we're increasing the, the size of our plant, we're increasing our sales force, we're, in, we're engaging in research and development. So we have this initial product, project, product that is popular and over time the marginal profitability of additional investment is falling. Now, I drew a horizontal line there, which is the first dollar reward to lobbying. So that's the profitability of the first dollar spent on lobbying. So here you can see, I can illustrate, the only way that capitalism is sustainable is if forever the last dollar spent on old fashioned capitalist investment is more profitable, that is above the line, than the first dollar reward to lobbying if it ever crosses. And we expect it to for a lot of industries. Microsoft for a long time didn't have any lobbyists, didn't really have anything to do with the government. Then they started to get antitrust suits and now they have almost an entire block on K Street. There are thousands of people that work in government relations for Microsoft in Washington, DC. So mature industries, and that's just what the falling curve means, because the falling curve you might think of as increasing marginal spending, but what it really is, is the growth path over time of these industries. As an industry matures, as it gets larger, the marginal profitability of additional plant equipment investment in new products falls. Apple has had a harder and harder time coming up with new innovations. 
at some point, it's going to be cheaper to try to get the government to remove taxes or to give them subsidies. It's going to be more profitable. So William Baumol, famously in his 1990 JPE paper, Journal of Political Economy, said, well, the total supply of entrepreneurs varies among society. The productive contribution of the society's entrepreneurial activities varies much more because of the allocation between productive activities, such as innovation, and largely unproductive activities, such as rent seeking or organized crime. This allocation is heavily influenced by the relative payoff society offers to such activities. This implies that policy can influence the allocation of entrepreneurship much more effectively than it can influence its supply. So if you spend any time in a developing nation, you see a whole bunch of entrepreneurs on the street trying to sell pencils or apples or anything else they can get their hand on. The spirit of, of entrepreneurship is alive and well in developing nations. What's not available is a set of public policies that will allow them to borrow money, to have property rights, and to be able to invest in plant and equipment that they can reliably get profits from. So instead, entrepreneurs operate in the gray economy or even the black market selling drugs. Those are also entrepreneurs. In the United States, we have for a very long time had been in the propitious condition of having investment be pretty reliably connected to a chance to earn profits. Well, that's great. What's interesting about this is, Baumol's claim is that countries don't differ much in entrepreneurial talent. What they differ in is the policies that reward entrepreneurship. Because I think people in the West have essentially a, a nearly racist idea that, well, all the entrepreneurship is here. If you spend much time in a developing nation, you're going to see people just hustling their butts off. There's plenty of entrepreneurship. What there isn't is a set of policies that allow entrepreneurs to capture the value that they're creating. So if we look at attempts to parse out what is driving companies' increased profitability. Return to capital is the largest. Research and development is significant. But according to this study, a substantial plurality is actually the return to regulation and lobbying. Now, that means that if you're a drug company and you have managed to have an interconnected set of patents on new drugs, and then you have the same drug and you put a new coating on it and you call it new and improved and you have a new patent on that for another 20 years, that sort of rent seeking can substitute for investment in new drugs. And it's way cheaper to design a new covering for the drug than it is to go through trials to come up with an entirely new and more effective drug. So let me remind you the distinction between some of the concepts that I've been talking about. Profits, we're working to compete by making better, faster steamboats, whatever. Rents, we're securing protection from competition, maybe from the legislature of, of New York in the case of steamboat competition. Rents prevent the creation of value. They create a return above normal or the opportunity cost return on an asset or activity. Rent seeking is the energy, time, and resources that's dissipated in the pursuit of rents. And that's destructive competition. That's actually a problem. Then rent extraction, the manipulation of rules or the physical environment to facilitate the collection of rents. So let me tell a story about that, and then I will have done. The story is this. I have a friend, John Allison, who was the CEO and one of the founders of BB&T Bank in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the largest banks in the Southeast at the time. So in 2008 and 2009, there was the Toxic Asset Relief Program, which was an attempt to buy up the bad assets on the corporate balance sheets of many financial companies. Now, John Ellison in 2006 had said, you know, mortgage-backed securities look like a pretty bad investment. I think we should unwind our position. So bb and got rid of all of its mortgage-backed securities. And at the time, a number of other banks said, well, that's crazy. I mean, you're just leaving return on the table. But it looked to John Allison as if the mortgage-backed securities were not a good investment. 
So in 2008 and 2009, that obviously proved correct. 2009 and 2010, the Treasury Department and the Securities Exchange Commission were trying to give out toxic asset relief program funds to buy up these bad assets. And of course, the story was that capitalism is just fundamentally flawed and unstable. And so we need to bail out these big companies, not because they took excessive risk, not because they themselves brought this on, but rather because capitalism is so unstable and unpredictable, we will not have a financial system if we do not subsidize it. And of course, the large Wall Street firms were by and large pretty happy with that story. But bb and was a fly in that ointment because bb and had gotten rid of all of theirs. So John Allison had a visit from the Treasury Department. And forgive me, this is a bad imitation, but I'll do my best. Treasury Department official comes in, sits down and says, yes, yeah, a nice office you've got here. It's a shame something was to, you know, happen to it. An audit, a fire, who knows how these things get started. I advise you to take the corp the toxic asset relief program funds, if you know what's good for you. So basically it's a protection racket. They threatened bb and with regulatory action if they embarrassed them by not accepting the toxic asset relief program funds. And John said, okay, I'll take your free money. Now it's pretty unusual that a corporate CEO would say free money, nope, not me, no thanks. But even if you did, the state cannot afford to allow that to happen. The state has to say, nope, you've got to accept this or it will make us look bad and we hate looking bad. We're not going to look bad, you're going to look bad because we're gonna audit you until we find something. So to reprise my story, there's an inherent tendency in capitalism, in a democracy, to substitute rent seeking for the, the pursuit of honest profits at some point just because of the logic of capitalism itself. So the, the competitive pursuit of profits means that the market for managers and the mergers and acquisitions market are going to make capitalism tend towards cronyism anyway. But that tendency is sharply exacerbated and probably made irresistible by the fact that the state has every incentive to encourage and in fact, if necessary, require companies to do as Adam Smith said they should not do and participate in schemes that make them easier to regulate collectively. So the point that I want to end with, and I, I, maybe we can talk in questions about some possible alternatives, but the point I wanna end with is to say, it looks like there really is a pretty strong tendency within capitalism to tend towards cronyism. And that many of the criticisms from people on the left have more merit than a lot of pro-market people have, have admitted. Just admitting, forgive me, just dismissing the criticism and saying, oh, that's not real capitalism, is no different from the left saying that Venezuela is not real socialism. The fact is in both cases, if that's the tendency that these systems have, we need to recognize that the ideal version doesn't constitute a valid defense of the actual practical use of, of that approach to organizing production. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions. If you'd like, you can enter your questions in the chat, um, or if we just have a few questions, if uh, you just want to recognize folks, either way. I might start off by asking about the stimulus checks um, that have been gone through and, and look like they're gonna to continue to go through Congress. Where do they fit in this overall plan? Rent seeking and subsidies work 
best when they are redistributed from some to others, because that's the easiest thing to claim political credit for. To the extent that the stimulus checks are more general, you, you may know, James, I've said that compared to the existing system, we'd be better off with something like a universal basic income. So our current system of patchwork welfare that mostly traps people in poverty, I think is a bad idea. So I would actually have stimulus checks routinized so we don't have to struggle with this, getting them every once in a while. You could actually rely on them and then stop anti-poverty programs, get rid of the minimum wage, get rid of social security. So I think we should either go farther in that direction or less far. As it stands, you're not sure if you're really going to get the stimulus check. It's not clear who's going to get it. So you can't really rely on it, but it does serve politicians' interest in the sense that you think, oh, I am so grateful. These politicians worked so hard to get this check for me. And in fact, it's easy to be generous with other people's money. But, but by and large, the stimulus checks probably, I, I would go quite a bit farther and routinize those things so long as I could also get rid of all of the explicit specific subsidies and laws like minimum wage. We have a question from Adam. Adam, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah. I was just saying, uh, wouldn't you be worried that people would, would stop working if they're just given money or, or not work as much? We give them money now to not work. How could they work less? There's right. a specific uh, requirement of welfare checks that you not have a job. How could it be yeah. worse than that? Would you be putting more people on welfare is the, is the point? No, because now they could still have jobs. Now, the, this talk is not about that. I've written quite a bit about it. I'm happy to share with it. The, the point is that there would be both a price and an income effect from an economics perspective. The price effect would be we would reduce the tax on getting a job. That would increase work. The income effect would mean that if you want to get $1,000 a month and live in your parents' basement and play Call of Duty, you can't. So it means that Chad working at Circle K just so he can play Call of Duty in his parents' basement, he probably would stop working. But the woman with three children who made some bad choices who could now get childcare and go to night school would become a productive member of society. So it, it's not just the net effect, it's that as it stands, we have a lot of bullshit jobs that people work in. And this would actually, I think, remember, we get to get rid of minimum wage. So a big part of this is that people could work in jobs where they would uh, be able to get training and get more experience. But I'm, I'm, I am happy to talk offline more about that. It is an interesting question. Okay, Evelyn, do you wanna ask your question? She has a question about GameStop and the stock trading. Yeah, so um, basically I kind of just wanted to know, you know, related to your talk, um, do you think that the government intervention and you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, hedge funds and everything trying to intervene and get Robin Hood and other apps to um, disallow buying of those stocks. Do you think that that does constitute as cronyism or do you think that might be a different type of situation than what you've talked about in your talk today? I think that we could have an entire talk about that, maybe an entire class about that because that's a really interesting question, Evelyn. Here's the short answer though, which I recognize is inadequate. Short selling is legal. And in short selling does not cause a decline in stock price. In fact, short selling limits the decline of stock price because it means some people, at least, in order to close out the short position, have to purchase the stock. What is illegal is something that's an ancient tactic called the pump and dump. Pump and dump is I buy shares of the stock and then I make announcements that the stock price is going to go up. You better buy this if you can. And then as soon as it does, I sell it. That's illegal. It's been illegal for a long time. So when, when I see the SEC and other government agencies intervene to prosecute a pump and dump, I don't think that's cronyism. I think that's just straightforwardly protecting the sanctity of markets. Okay. And just a quick follow-up question. So then even if somebody says, like somebody who bought GameStop says, well, I intended to hold it for the long run, that doesn't constitute as like a valid excuse? You can buy whatever you want if you collude if you conspire with other people to increase the stock price, that is a prima facie violation. Now, I don't know if it should be, 
But it, that, that's an old crime. Pump and dump is an old crime. So you and I and a bunch of other people say we're going to buy the stock price and we're going to make public announcements to try to inflate its value. And yeah, I was going to hold on to it for a long time. Sure you were. Maybe you were. You do not get to collude to try to influence the price. Okay, thank you. Uh, Genevieve, you have a question about ethics and ethics training. Sure. Um, so I was just thinking about, should we start requiring more ethics training at the citizen level, the public servant level? And because as public servants, we aspire to be ethical leaders and have ethical codes, but it's not always necessarily something innate that we kind of come up with. You sort of have to learn how to be more ethical. <clears throat> Ethics classes in business school and law school tend to be listing a set of violations and then teaching people how to not get caught doing those things. So that's not exactly ethics. Now, schools of government may be a little different. I worry that the problem is not so much teaching of ethics. I agree that it's not innate, but I don't know that we should be doing that in it seems like that maybe should be something that we're doing in high school and in college. It's not part of a career. It's just part of being a citizen. And so it's interesting that in arguing this out to myself, I end up just sounding like the sort of old conservatives who used to hate public choice, who just hate J. Dell. They see J. Dell walk into a room and they say, that guy is one of those public choice monsters. Well, the fact is we should be worried about people acting badly. And we have the capacity to feel shame when we get caught acting badly. So we ought to teach people that we value virtue and ethics because it's the right thing to do, not because it will benefit them and they won't get caught for doing wrong things. So to the extent that public choice was interpreted, and it has been to some extent, as a sort of license to ignore morality and virtue, that we'll just have rules. We don't need good people. I think that's been a mistake. We've gone too far and we should emphasize the importance of electing good people. And that, that sounds awfully silly to someone outside of public choice, but within the sort of field where I live, the ah, a good public official, what are you kidding? This actually really matters. People's character really matters. So Genevieve, you're, you're absolutely right. I would just say we need to do even more than that. Okay, Hudson has a question about uh, reducing the incentives for rent sinking behavior. Uh, yes, so to be a little more specific, what institutions, set of rules or dogmas or like behaviors can we actively support now to reduce the incentive for companies in large in this country uh, to seek those rent seeking behaviors? There's two things I think we can do. One is, we can recognize that the United States is blessed with such a dynamic market system and capitalism does have one big advantage over other systems and I can summarize it in one word, liquidity. The argument for capitalism is liquidity, the ability to direct large amounts of liquid capital to profitable investments very quickly. And so a dynamic new industry for years, maybe a decade, is going to want to have little to do with the government because they're very profitable on their own. So a dynamic industry where we, the, where we have new thing, Twitter and Uber, they don't get along very well with the government. Maybe some point they'll be bought off. But for now, at least, they're pretty antagonistic. The second thing we can do, and I, I want somebody to put this together, maybe put together a grant, but I think we should have an index of corporate social responsibility. Now, the index of corporate social responsibility for most people on the left has to do with green energy and a number of things that may be perfectly valuable. But my index of corporate social responsibility would be people who do not engage in cronyism. And so if I'm a consumer and I'm going to buy coffee or I'm going to buy a car, I can look at this index of corporate social responsibility and say, ah, Ford did not accept TARP money or some company did not accept handouts and subsidies from the government to the extent that consumer decisions can be directed toward companies that behave responsibly and don't accept corporate handouts. That would be a way that consumers at the margin a little bit, that we could reduce the transactions cost of unorganized consumers. So I want an index of corporate responsibility, but have it be based on eschewing opportunities for rent seeking. 
Okay, Adam has a, another uh, question about the Be Lovely app. Adam? Yeah, uh, you brought this up on EconTalk. And uh, for those who haven't watched it, basically, uh, there's there's like a Black Mirror episode that does something very similar where you can go around judging people um, and how lovely they are being. Uh, I thought that it's an interesting way to keep people um, ethical. I have nothing to add to that. You're exactly right. Uh, thanks for calling me out to say that that was not my idea. It was Russ Roberts. I hate you all. I, but I, I don't know which one came first. That oh, or the, it was Russ. The Black Mirror it, no, it was episode. totally Russ. Thanks. Thanks yeah. very much. No, I mean the Black the Black Mirror episode. Okay, the, fine. It still wasn't me. I understand. You might have watched it. Yeah. I, I, I had a follow up question. Uh, didn't Dodd Frank also uh, force banks to have more cash on hand to make it so that they weren't such a, a big risk? It's such a great thing, isn't it? Suppose you were a large existing bank and you're worried about small, nimble new banks. Now, ideally, you might want to live, because you're, you're large, you might want to live in an unregulated setting, but that's not going to happen. So what you could do is embrace a set of regulations that do two things. First, you have to keep large amounts of capital that have no return on hand. And then second, you have to hire a compliance staff of at least 20 people. The fixed cost of those two things will prevent any new entries into the banking industry. So if I have, tw I have to have 20 accountants before I can make a dollar on my first investment, and I have to have enough cash on hand, which I cannot invest, that I can, again, not make any money on it. So that's perfect because it sounds like, oh, they're, they're all that money on compliance, they've got to fill out all these forms, they have to do reporting. The effect has been, to make an already concentrated industry even more concentrated. So let me ask, who do you think in the House of Representatives received the most, by far, Wall Street contributions? Yes, that's right, Barney Frank. Barney Frank was bought and paid for by Wall Street. And that regulation was exactly what Wall Street wanted. It's not surprising. And the great thing, the genius of Barney Frank, was that he was admired by the left for doing it. So my hat is off to Barney Frank, because he managed to make everybody happy, except consumers, because we now are down to about four or five Wall Street firms, and there is no hope of any other large firms entering because of Dodd-Frank. We are nearing the end of the hour. Michael does have a question about whether cronyism is a product of democracy or capitalism. Michael? Those are these are dangerous waters, Michael. Are you saying we should get rid of democracy? Well, that, that's kind of my question is ah! what institutions can you have in a democracy that would prevent these things from happening and wouldn't trample on you know, important things like freedom of speech? Just can't be done. It turns out majorities are always gonna be in favor of it because they're poorly informed and politicians are going to find it pretty easy to make arguments. If you're Barney Frank, you can go out and say, look, all these regulations are gonna help. They're gonna be great. We're really gonna put some restrictions on these big companies. They're gonna to have to have compliance. They're gonna to have to have reporting on rules. They have to have more cash on hand. And voters are gonna say, yes, preach brother. So my view is that either you're Singapore, which is pretty capitalist, but is a dictatorship and has a lot of political repression, but a lot of growth, a lot of strong property rights, or your capitalism in a democracy, in which case we constantly have to fight this fight. So the, I, I think it is very difficult to have marginal restrictions. Now, before, for, for a very long time, the United States had protections on freedom of contract. Um, but those disappeared in the early part of the 20th century. And so as a result of that, it is now possible to impose restrictions and th they're well-intended restrictions. I shouldn't be cynical. No, Barney Frank, I'm cynic cynical about, but many politicians honestly think this is a way to improve public policy. <sighs> Not all of them do. I'm still public choice enough to recognize that there's a cynical middle ground where people are able to 
sell gullible voters the story that we're benefiting voters while knowing that they're actually benefiting large concentrated economic power. And for a politician, that's the sweet spot. If I can appear to serve voters, but actually serve the corporations that are paying me off. So on, on the other hand, there are two things we can do. One is dynamic industry. And the second, I said corporate social responsibility. We can have vo better voters. I could go out and I could give talks like this. I can write books to talk about this. I can make an effort to say, you need to realize that this is such a difficult problem that we need to work on this together. So I, I don't think it's hopeless by any means. But I do think that saying, isn't it a problem of democracy? It's not a problem just of democracy. It is a problem of the coincidence of democracy and capitalism. And it means that those of us who defend capitalism in a democracy need to be more honest about saying this is a problem. The criticisms of the left have considerable merit. Okay, if we can ask, ask you to uh, indulge us and give us one final question. Jeff Milo has a question on reforms. Well, Mike, is, uh, is campaign finance reform the cure to this tendency to crony capitalism? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, you could have at least had a fake name and a mask or something. Um, no, Professor Milo, it is not. Uh, because the fact is that the amount of money that we're talking about from campaign contributions is a small amount of corporate influence. And I'm campaign finance, as you know perfectly well, is actually usually the means by which challengers are able to finance raising questions about entrenched cronyist incumbents. And so it seems like, oh, all we need to do is have public financing. All we need to do is get rid of private money. Well, no, the problem is that it is in the interests of, I, I sound Marxist, I realize, but it is in the interests of both corporations and elite politicians to advance the interests of the powerful. And so as tempting as it is to say, well, first thing we'll do is have campaign finance and get less money in politics. What we need to have, and this is sort of like Michael's question, we need to have less politics in money. If politicians had less power over subsidies and protection of profits, then there wouldn't be that much spending on campaigns to begin with. The government is too important to corporations. In 1989, I worked as a consultant in the Chilean presidential election, the first election after the coup. And I remember walking the streets of Santiago and thinking, I hope I never live in a country where elections are this important. Well, darn it. I live in a country where elections are really important and that's a bad sign. So the Campaign finance reform, we can always reform, we can always do things better, maybe there are some problems, but that's not the heart of the issue. Get, getting rid of the ability of private citizens to participate in government is part of the problem, it's not the solution. But I do thank you for raising that deeply cynical question. Well, with that, uh, although Jay would like us to see more equations, I think we're at the end of our hour, so we're going to have to let you go. Uh, I, I hope everyone will join me in giving a virtual thank you, <laughs> a virtual wave for the thoughtful and, and, and provocative presentation you've made. With that, that's at the end of our time. Uh, for those faculty that would like to hang around, we're going to have a... Um, a short happy hour of you and your favorite beverage and a little more discussion with uh, Mike Munger. Uh, thank you again, Mike, for coming in and talking to us today. And you can take off the jacket and let loose the tie if you'd like. So, Mike, uh, with your mention of my, my preference to see equations and dissertations and my public choice orientation, I want you to know I've been dropped from about a half a dozen graduate committees over the last 30 minutes. <laughs> well, that's your own fault. <laughs> I'll be right back with the beverage of my choice. <laughs> so, if anyone asks, I was wearing a tie the whole time. <laughs>
Uh, Jacob, uh, I don't seem to be able to stop the recording. We might want to do that. That's a good idea.